frustrating because there, there are not many instances in the modern world where those who, who have been refugees have conducted themselves with such dignity and honor. And the hosts, despite challenging economic situation, probably the last 20 years have been the, the most difficult for the people of Pakistan in terms of our economic situation. So the host, despite unemployment, competition for jobs, the way they have uh, kept their relation, the wonderful relationship with the uh, Afghan refugees. Um, let me just point out a side effect, a pleasant side effect of the Afghan refugees. The children in the refugee camps started watching the Pakistan cricket team and learning how to play cricket. And Afghanistan today has an international cricket team. But the embarrassing thing is that their under-19 cricket team beat Pakistan under-19 cricket team. Um, I hope uh, they don't beat us, uh, our full cricket team. But this is uh, a remarkable relationship that has endured. And I again repeat, considering the situation in Pakistan, what we faced, uh, what our economy has faced. And it reminds me of uh, one thing which I learned during my, when I was raising funds in, in my country for various charities, that generosity has nothing to do with one's bank balance. A country uh, in the situation that we were, and I really say with pride that the way we have hosted uh, our refugees. Bear in mind that Pakistan, when it came into being in 1947, had the biggest refugee problem. And my mother's family, of course, also were refugees coming from India in 1947. Uh, I want to refer to what the uh, Afghanistan vice president said when he talked about uh, our holy prophet, peace be upon him, and uh, the, the Muslim migrants to Medina. You see, the reason why I feel that this relationship endured in Pakistan for 40 years was because of uh, our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who, who when, when they migrated from uh, Makkah to Medina when they faced religious persecution, that relationship between the people, hosts of Medina, and um, uh, the refugees from Mecca was exemplary. And it has stayed in the Muslim psyche for all these centuries. And the second aspect I want to highlight about uh, the, the great characteristic about our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was that he, he was the ultimate leader. He believed in uniting human beings. His title given to him in, in our book, Holy Quran, was a mercy for mankind, not for Muslims, for mankind. And he showed an example of forgiving all the people who persecuted him and then uniting human beings. And this is the hallmark of a good leader. We love Nelson Mandela because he forgave the people who persecuted him, united human beings, saved South Africa. And unfortunately, when we look at much richer countries, this is not the case. Political leaders use refugee problems for dividing humanity. To get votes, they transfer hatred towards the refugees who already are suffering. Who wants to be a refugee? It, it is probably the most difficult decision for a human being to leave his home. And so as it is, the refugees are suffering because they are refugees. And on top of it, they face the xenophobia in so many influential, affluent, rich countries. On top of it, we have this new phenomenon after 9-11, Islamophobia. 
Islamophobia compounds the miseries of Muslim refugees. Uh, and Islamophobia, we all know, it's, it came after 9-11 because terrorism and Islam were equated, Islamic terrorism. People could not tell the difference. The extremes in a human society, all human societies have moderates, liberals, and extremists. And if you concentrate on the extremes of a human society, you can demonize any human society. When as a teenager, when I went to England for the first time, there were these uh, people called the skinheads. They would go around beating people because of the color of their skin. Imagine if I had defined the British society by what I saw of the skinheads. I would have ended up demonizing one of the most liberal societies in the world. This is what is happening with Islam. And that's why Muslim refugees suffer more than other refugees. I'm, Mr. Secretary General, I'm especially worried about what is happening across the border in India. An extremist ideology has taken over a country of over a billion people with nuclear arms. This, the ideology which talks about racial superiority and then shifts the blame for why this uh, race hasn't attained its so-called great potential, they shift it towards another minority and, uh, and uh, spread hate against him. This is the easiest way of getting votes. Nationalist parties all over the world now are gaining by actually blaming another human community for all their problems. And in India, with two legislation, the Registration Act uh, and the, the Citizen Act, two legislation which are actually target 200 million people in, in India, Muslims in India. This, in future, if it's not checked, if the world community doesn't uh, raise its voice against it, this injustice, this will have future problems for our country because it, it could have a huge ref refugee problem. The BJP leaders, we watch them on television. When the protest, people protest against this unfair le legislation, Muslims protest, they tell them to go to Pakistan. And secondly, what is happening in Kashmir? Eight million people are still in an open prison for over six months. It's because of this ideology. And this again has severe implications in the future if the world community doesn't raise its voice against it. And finally, about Afghanistan, um, the Afghan Vice President, um, thank you for saying uh, uh, complimentary things about me. But let me just clear first of all. It is my belief, it's not something I'm saying because of this conference or because I'm being a diplomat. It is my belief that the people of Afghanistan in the last 40 years have suffered more than any other human community. And I pray from my heart that the, these peace talks succeed in Afghanistan. We have been, ever since I've, my government has come into power, we have tried our best. Whatever support we can give to these peace talks, I can tell you we have tried our best. Mr. Zalmeh Khalid Zad is sitting here. I've had several meetings with him. He knows that the whole country is on the same page. Our security forces are on the same page. Normally, this was, there was an idea that the security forces in Pakistan had their own policy and the government a different one. This is not the case in Pakistan anymore. Whatever the situation might have been in the past, right now I can tell you, all of us, there's one thing we want is peace in Afghanistan. It's not just because we have uh, uh, 1.4 million registered refugees. We are the second uh, country in the world with the second biggest refugee population. And for 22 years, we were the number one country with the biggest uh, uh, refugee population. It's not because of that. Because the people of Afghanistan deserve peace. That's the most important thing. Just on a 
uh, as a human being, we should all hope that the long-suffering Afghan people finally have peace. And we will be doing everything. We are doing everything to facilitate this process. And not only doing everything, we are praying that this uh, peace process now moves forward in the right direction. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Pre uh, Vice President, you mentioned about safe havens in Pakistan. I can tell you that there are no safe havens here. After 9-11, it, it is possible that there were uh, uh, places where the militants who were uh, fighting in, in Afghanistan, it's possible they stayed. But then we have refugee camps for over 500,000 people, over 100,000 people. How is any government supposed to check a few thousand militants if they operate from within them. So in a way, it is important for peace so that the refugees, the conditions in Afghanistan are such that the refugees can go back. So then we can take responsibility if some, someone operates from this side. But with still 2.7 million Afghans here, it is not possible for us to completely guarantee, although we are building a fence now, and almost the fence has been completed, but it is still not possible. But rest assured, it is not in our interest that there's conflict in Afghanistan. Not in our interest. Number one, I repeat, because we want peace in Afghanistan on a humanitarian level. And we've always had, uh, and even before Pakistan came into being, this, this part of uh, uh, India always had close ties with Afghanistan. In fact, for 80 years or 70 years, this was part of Afghanistan where you're sitting right now. So, Number one, on humanitarian basis. Number two, because our areas on the borders, on the Duran line, either side of the border, this war on terror has devastated the people. There's massive poverty there. And the one way we can actually bring jobs and prosperity is by having trading relationship and peaceful relationship. So, to rehabilitate the merged districts that have become part of Pakistan. And I, at one point, half the population of the merged district was internally displaced, internal refugees. So to, to uh, bring them, uh, give them jobs, bring prosperity, we need peace in Afghanistan. And then for the future, the connectivity between Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia, uh, as uh, Mr. Vice President mentioned again, that is the future. Trade. It is how we will give. We have the second youngest population in the world. We need to give them jobs. Jobs won't come with conflict. We need peace. So let me assure you that it is not in the interest of Pakistan for there to be any strife in Afghanistan. Whatever, I don't know, whatever uh, the policies might have been before, but I can tell you since one and a half years my government has come into power, we have done everything, and I really mean everything, to facilitate the Afghan peace process. Finally, Secretary General, I want to especially welcome you here. Uh, I want to welcome you because it's a very important time. I think the UN must play its part. I don't say it as political point scoring, I really am worried of what is happening in India. And it's not just me who's worried. If you look at the demonstrations in India, what is going on, the civil society, the intellectuals, the, op the, the opposition party members, everyone is worried what's happening there. I know India. I used to play cricket, and cricket, as you know, uh, the India-Pakistan cricket match you know, was bigger than most of you probably watch Soccer World Cup. This was the biggest event that ever used to take place. And I can tell you, this is not the India I know. This is not the India of Nehru and Gandhi. This is something unique that's happening. And as a student of history, whenever, whenever an ideology that is based on hate and which brings in this ultra-nationalism of, of, of any race, 
it always ends up in bloodshed. This ideology was inspired by the Nazi Germans, by the Nazis. You just have to read the, what their founding fathers said about uh, the Nazis, how they admired them, the racial purity, and how the ethnic cleansing of Jews was accepted by them. And if this ideology is not checked, like in the 30s, the Nazi ideology was not checked, it will end up in massive bloodshed. This is not a small joke, a country of over a billion people, Pakistan a country of over 200 million people. And in future, if the United Nations does not, does not play its part, this could become one of the flashpoints in the world. And that's why I'm mean, not to alarm you, but prevention is better than cure. Before things go out of hand, and um, the statement of Indian Prime Minister that they can destroy Pakistan in 11 days, does a responsible Prime Minister of a country of 200, of over a billion people, does he make a statement like that? And then the army chief saying that they can take over Pakistan side of Kashmir whenever the parliament signals. So it is heading in the wrong direction. I was in the United Nations uh, in September, and I, this was the first time I flagged it. Things have only gone worse since then, and unless the world community takes notice, things will get far worse. Thank you.